Good afternoon. Welcome to the show. During today's show, we will discuss critical issues facing government and industry leaders in securing cyberspace. With me on the show today are Mr. Brendan Good, the Director, Network Security Deployment Office of Cybersecurity and Communications, Department of Homeland Security, Lieutenant General Ed Cardone, the Commanding General, Army Cyber, U.S. Army, Rear Admiral Marshall Lytle, the Director, C4 Systems and CIO, U.S. Cyber Command, Louis Temkin, the Vice President, Technical Director, General Dynamics Information Technology, Scott Stevens, Senior Security Strategist, Strategist at Dell Federal and Jason Wright, Senior Manager, Global Field Product Management at Sourcefire. We're talking cybersecurity and talk about an issue that's a hot issue these days. I mean, we couldn't uh, couldn't have picked one uh, that's uh, probably as prominent in the news as we have uh, with cybersecurity right now. But let's start. Let's start with uh, Rear Admiral <coughs> Lytle and talk a little bit. Can you cite some examples of areas where you think we're making some progress in this? I know it's a challenging area. Where where do you see progress being made, Rear Admiral? Sure, Jim. There's certainly lots to talk about in this domain. It's very fast moving. Things are changing. Very complex. Um, the, DO, the DOD's IT environment is extremely complex, and we would say excessively complex. Thousands of enclaves, different standards, different connections, very difficult to share information, defend, and maintain in this environment, particularly from a U.S. Cyber camp, CyberCom perspective. So two years ago, across the department, we started this effort called to share IT infrastructure and enterprise services and move to a single security model called the Joint Information Environment, or JIE. Um, the goals for this JIE environment are threefold. The first is mission effectiveness, and that's not just a cyber mission, but we need to create an environment where all of our warfighting domain missions are effective. We need to be able to share information easily across the domain within the COCOMs. Mm -hmm. The second main goal is defensibility of the Department of Defense's networks. We need to create an environment where we can, from CyberCon's perspective, defend this environment for the nation. Our current environment with thousands of different networks and different support structures and different uh, standards is very difficult to support. The third uh, main goal is the efficiency of the system, and that really feeds the first two. Okay. We've got um, duplicate systems, redundant email systems, et cetera. You can pick a bunch of examples uh, across the department. We need to get to a more efficient environment that we can not only operate and maintain and work on it more effectively, but that could, in this uh, limited fiscal environment, right. it could realize savings that we could then contribute back into an increased security posture that we have. Terrific. And moving things in the department is, you know, obviously the Department of Defense is a very large environment right. and very difficult right. and complex. It's right. kind of a monumental task. So in the two years we've been working on it, we've come up with a whole lot of good architecture so far. We're working on some examples in Europe and, and coming up in Pacific Command for how we're going to implement this. So we've made a lot of good progress toward this. We've got a long way to go. And from CyberCon's perspective, we can't get there fast enough. Right, right. <laughs> good. And I'm going to come back mm -hmm. to, <clears throat> and hear about some of those uh, examples mm -hmm. you're talking about. And yeah, you, yeah, the amount of complexity, I, I feel like this whole area we've been putting on Band-Aids for years and years and years and years and years. You know, something blows up, if something happens, we throw a fix in there. And I, I like what you're saying there. What we really need to do is step back and look at how can we come up with a holistic approach to address mm -hmm. some of this. Uh, Lieutenant General Cardone, what are some of the areas that you're seeing progress being made over at uh, the Army? So, Jim, I'll just highlight four areas. So, okay. first, uh, we've created a global standardized security posture so then we can better see our networks and this allows better, quicker identification, analysis, and mitigation mm -hmm. to both attacks and vulnerabilities. The second big one is we have established two regional cyber centers, one in the United States, one in Europe thus far. And what we've this enabled us to do is harness intelligence to inform our efforts and how we better protect and defend our networks. The third part is information sharing agreements. Mm -hmm. And primarily up to this point, this has been with government, counterintelligence, law enforcement, and the intelligence community. Right. But clearly that has to open up over time to the private community as well, much sure. like the Department of Homeland Security has done. And finally, as Marshall talked about, network modernization is critical because we have to reduce our attack surface. Sure. The networks were formed from the bottom, yeah. and now we're trying to create a top-down structure to consolidate that. I think those four things are areas we're making huge progress but as Marshall said, it's not fast enough. Yeah, it's interesting that the, the two of you had very sim similar types of uh, things you're talking about, making progress. So, I mean, that's a good thing. I mean, uh, <coughs> Lewis uh, Temkin over General Dynamics, what are you, what, where are you seeing progress in supporting government folks and supporting your customers to help them get out in front of some of these issues? Well, I think it's it really comes across in three areas. Uh, okay. You know, we see uh, certainly 
awareness. You know, overall, uh, 10 years ago, many people said, why cyber? Now they get it. They understand that, you know, that networks can be attacked, uh, you know, and, and the damage can be as critical as a physical attack. Sure. on our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so we are building strong cyber defense uh, capabilities throughout DOD. We're working with other agencies and strategies for our national critical protection infrastructure. Uh, and, and I think it's reflected in the resourcing. You know, you see both DHS and uh, Cyber Command have increased budgets. Mm -hmm. uh, Army is standing up uh, U.S. Army Cyber at Fort Gordon with the Center of Excellence there. Uh, so those are very significant uh, activities that are occurring that are making significant progress. So I yeah. think overall it's much improved. <clears throat> I agree, and I think the uh, the dollars. It's the it's nice to see cyber uh, security ha being a priority in the budget and priority. Uh, and it's nice it's nice having a budget. <laughs> the uh, <clears throat> the it, you know, and I still though we'll talk about this maybe when we talk about the future. I still feel that we're still somewhat reactive. I think it got the awareness because of things that have happened you know, and identity theft uh, um, and, and credit card thefts and, and so forth. So, you know, I guess when we get to the future question down the road, we'll talk about, are we going to get more proactive to get out in front of these things? Uh, Brendan Good over at Department of Homeland Security, uh, you, you guys play a major, major role in this category, <clears throat> in this particular field. Where are some of the areas you see progress being made, Brendan? Uh, in particular, I see it as in the area of increased focus on information sharing. Um, I think that's one of the most uh, challenging and significant strategic challenges that we face, uh, in particular making sure that we are able to get the right information to the right people at the right time. Uh, it's been a focus uh, within our program offices within DHS, but I think you also reflected into the executive orders and the presidential directives that have recently come out. <coughs> Um, to do that has taken quite a bit of work, not only right. in the areas of, you know, smart engineering, but also on the management and operation side. Uh, within the federal civilian government alone, we have been standing up interagency teams just to discuss um, exactly these principles of how to automate uh, data and exchanges so that we are delivering contextual information uh, to agencies, to our customers, um, that's meaningful. So part of the success that I think the past year and the upcoming year uh, brings with that focus on uh, information sharing is uh, two things. One is making sure that the data gets to the uh, responsible organizations and officials so that they can make decisions. Um, and in particular for DHS, it's uh, uh, making sure that they are able to do their job so that we can focus more on the enterprise job. That allows us to open up the capacity that we have. We talked about the uh, increasing resources mm -hmm. that come with it, but it is in, with a decreasing <coughs> workload that goes along with it as well, so That's we have true. to become more efficient. So the information <coughs> sharing area has been kind of a large strategic uh, area that we put a lot of investment on to help us become more efficient. Yeah, terrific. That information sharing, too, and I think a lot of people think, uh, well, how hard is that? But when you actually get into information sharing, there are some real, real tough issues there. I know back in my Treasury days, we were trying to work to understand what was going on with uh, you know, computer fraud and things like that with banks and the financial community and whatever, and you quickly realize you know, some of these institutions are not, are not, do not want to advertise, you know, what's happening. And so you have to find ways to move that information around securely and with trust and confidence that you're not going to be, you know, uh, <clears throat> making them vulnerable. Um, Scott Stevens over Dell. Tell us how Dell's positioned here and how, what kinds of things are you doing to support your customers in this space? Yeah, well, you know, first, certainly can answer that. And thank you for the invitation to be here. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to touch upon something that uh, Lewis and Brandon were just talking about. And I think last year, there's a lot of significant actions that occurred around cybersecurity. Part of that was the, the uh, presidential directive and executive order that came out last mm -hmm. February. And so the ability to be able to um, take a look at this at a higher level across agency is putting a renewed focus and I think what's happening here is we're talking more now about best practice because what we're, what we're seeing with our uh, federal agency customers is this is such a large issue to deal with. And there are so many different right. facets and aspects. You know, how do you get a hold of this? Right. And so the ability to move, let's say, from more of a compliance or audit-based uh, type system to something that's more along best practices, I think is going to bring a lot of long-term value over right. time. And one of the examples that I would use here is um, DHS and NIST have been, uh, they've had five workshops in the last year, and they're going to release a new cybersecurity framework. 
Mm -hmm. That's actually going to be uh, a foundation to be able to pull together what these best practices look like, kind of um, try to position what good looks like, right. if you will. Right. And so I think that these are the right discussions that are going to make some real impact as we move forward in the right. future. Right. Very good. You know, the, you know, we call this radio show cybersecurity, but if you look at the shows we do, almost every show <coughs> has cybersecurity somewhere embedded in it. I mean, yeah, we do yeah. identity management, we do information and intelligence sharing, we do you know, uh, big data analytics, whatever. They all include this, so you're right. When you say cybersecurity, the scope of that particular discussion can go all kinds of directions. Uh, Jason Wright over at uh, <coughs> Sourcefire, tell us um, what, some of the progress you see being made in uh, working with your customer base. Certainly uh, some of the things have been mentioned here already about awareness and, and even one of the things you mentioned at the beginning of the show was the amount of media coverage that mm -hmm. we've seen about some of the uh, high profile attacks that are losing millions and millions of uh, credit card information, uh, credit card records and personally identifiable information out there. So uh, the, the amount of, of attention that's being paid to the industry certainly increased and that brings awareness and that brings a lot of the information sharing even, right? It gets people wanting to work together to find a solution here. Um, in addition, we've also seen from a technological perspective, um, a little bit more of a movement towards solutions, the security solutions and where it makes sense combining security technologies into a single platform and a single point of management. Um, and especially, more technologically speaking, looking deeper into the network and having an increased level of visibility into what's actually on the network itself. And that sounds kind of common sense, but a lot of security technologies don't really see what's going on on the network. They don't profile the network and understand right. the assets. So it's more about know thyself and know thy network. Mm -hmm. so that you can protect it better. Yeah. And that's where we see a lot of, uh, a lot of security technologies moving towards the increased level of visibility yeah, of what's Yeah, you know, you're exactly right. There's a lot of discussion, <clears throat> a lot of the, you know, continuous monitoring discussion and everything else, and people talk about, you know, the perimeter of security, which, <clears throat> which, of course, is important. And they talk about security of data at rest, which, of course, is important, too. But the point you're bringing up, which I agree with, is all those devices inside yeah. the network and what's inside them, you know, and are there things sitting in there that need to be discovered that maybe they're not passing through the perimeter and they're not data at rest. Yeah, so uh, and it's a, constantly changing, right? <coughs> Absolutely. Mobile devices are coming on. There's so many new applications that are running on these mobile devices and new operating systems that we have that the network composition is under a constant state of change. So how do you secure those assets when they're always changing. Right. Very good. Uh, Lieutenant General uh, Cardone, what's a, a program that you would cite as one that uh, you, you feel like we've really doing some, some cool things with? Well, I think, I think there's two, but okay. uh, the use of red teams, I think, is critical. And red teams to hammer your own network right. and find your vulnerabilities so you can patch those and then be able to operate while compromised, mm -hmm. that's critical. And we've... Uh, we have a world-class cyber op four that we've been using against our tactical formations oh, now for a while. And I think that's doing a lot to bring awareness, bring a lot of attention to vulnerabilities, some which will have to be solved technologically, but there's a lot we can do operationally through best practices, as we've referred here, that could help. Mm -hmm. I think the second big area we've, we're focusing on is the importance of people in okay. cybersecurity <clears throat> yeah. and the development of the cyber mission forces uh, we have, that is our, my number one priority, is to get this right. We'll have a five-fold increase this year by the end of, uh, of uh, 2014, and so we're very excited about that. The challenge is, is the leader development and talent management of this sure. force sure. inside of the government. And uh, we're making some good strides, but a lot of work ahead of us. Right. <clears throat> I actually taught graduate school on, on weekends in cybersecurity at the University of Maryland. And <clears throat> when we started, I had Secret Service time, when we started, we had hardly anybody now the, 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 it has exploded. And in fact, when people talk to me about careers of the future, I tell them, get into cybersecurity, because huh? we're going to need, need knowledgeable people in that space. Uh, Brendan Good, <clears throat> how about uh, over DHS? What's a program you would cite as one that you think is really making great progress over at DHS that uh, you're involved with? 
I think that's a tough question because I think we've had uh, several successes at the department over the past year, but I'd like to pick one that's very uh, specific to me, okay. uh, in particular to me, which is the Einstein 3 Accelerated or E3A uh, program. I think that's one we've all heard about. That is <clears throat> Correct. And it, uh, for those not familiar with it, it's focused on providing intrusion prevention capabilities to be able to do the real-time identification and disruption of malicious activity uh, affecting our federal civilian uh, .gov networks. Uh, about 18 months or so ago, we made a, a very strategic shift at a time realizing that public and private sector innovation uh, was really uh, setting a standard for cybersecurity that we wanted to take fuller advantage of. And so uh, at that shift point, we decided that there was a closer partnership with uh, managed security vendors and uh, uh, coupling that with the uh, information that we have from the government side, from our networks, from partnering with <laughs> communities like DOD and our federal uh, departments and agencies, that we combine those two, we'd be able to deliver a, an efficient and effective uh, capability. Uh, last summer, uh, we were uh, excited when we had our first opportunity to protect our first agency uh, inside the federal government. Um, since then, we've uh, ramped up to be able to cover now a quarter of the federal government. So it uh, really uh, showed what we thought what could happen, which was that ability to deploy rapidly, be able to take quick advantage of uh, private sector capabilities, um, and to be able to start defending uh, .gov networks. Uh, we have a pretty long queue of agencies, having seen the benefits ready to turn on over the uh, remainder of 2014 as well. <coughs> Um, with that, I think there's a second program that we were pretty excited about, which was how do we take what we're doing for the .gov and make it available to the critical infrastructure as well. Um, enhanced Cybersecurity Services, or ECS, uh, also mentioned as part of the uh, uh, executive order in the presidential directive, uh, was that um, program or effort. How do we um, institute policies that allow us to uh, transition our knowledge and information to the private sector and let them use that information through commercial service providers and start defending uh, uh, critical infrastructure companies. And right. so in the past year, setting the policies, bringing uh, companies on board, and now creating a base that uh, can take advantage of the same services we do for ourselves, I think it's been yeah, a tremendous excellent. success. I, I know sometimes the private sector, having been sitting through on some boards and things like that, you know, I mean, usually the board's interested in uh, reducing cost and... Uh, and generating more revenue and um, uh, my stock price. And when you br bring in security there, you say, now how does that help me reduce my costs and generate revenue? But I think what we're learning based on what's going on is that companies that do take security serious are being seen now as trusted companies. And I think they're going to, over time, start I mean, I won't mention companies here, but those that have been attacked and are, are now have the reputation of perhaps having some issues are likely to struggle. Um, <clears throat> Rear Admiral Lytle, uh, how about a program in your area that you think you've really made some good progress on and you'd like to talk about a little bit here? I'd like to build on something General Cardone mentioned okay. about the Cyber Mission Force. Uh, Cybercom has three main missionaries, defend the nation, operate and defend the department's networks, and provide cyber capability support to the combatant commands. The This year, was a major milestone was reached with the creation of that cyber mission force. In the halls of the Pentagon, everybody knows what a battalion means, what a platoon brings to the table, what a fleet, what a squadron, what a right. sector brings. Right. But what was that measure, what was that unit of cyber capability that we could bring to the table? With the creation of the cyber mission force, we've been able to define those roles, create a training pipeline, a certification pipeline, and a mission organization to those capabilities and those forces so that we can bring some capability to the table in cyber environments. So just this year, as John Cardone was mentioning, we're starting to get into that training pipeline, we're starting to resource that, the services are getting together to provide that, so we have a organized and, and trained force ready to go on this. Terrific. Well, I'm telling you, I'm excited about hearing the progress we're hearing about. I, I want to hear from our private sector uh, <clears throat> guest on this same topic, too, but first we're going to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Fleisick here with Brendan Good from the Department of Homeland Security, Lieutenant General Cardone from the U.S. Army, Rear Admiral Lytle, from U.S. Cyber Command, Lewis Temkin from General Dynamics Information Technology, Scott Stevens from Dell Federal, and Jason Wright from Sourcefire. We're talking cybersecurity. When we went to break, we heard from our government guests a, a little bit about some programs that they believe are making some very good progress. Uh, Jason, from where you sit, what, what are some programs that you see that uh, you feel like are, are really moving forward now? Well, it's, it's tough to talk about successes in this market. 
right? If we are doing our job and we block threats and we keep our network secure, we don't make the news, yeah, it's like unfortunately. It's right? like successful <laughs> if nothing happens. Yes, yeah, so no news is good news, right? So um, uh, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's only newsworthy when there's a mistake that happens and a breach that happens. But some of the successes that we've seen uh, stem around uh, uh, response times especially. Right, we're seeing existing customers that have talked to us and said that they are able to identify new, brand new, unknown, zero-day threats for which there is no signature out there, no, right. no pre-existing knowledge of how this threat works. And they're able to identify, isolate, and remediate that threat you know, within half an hour, 40 minutes. Right. You know, that's, a, that's a fantastic response time. Yeah. Right. Um, other customers that are able to to use the the visibility that I spoke of earlier to reduce the number of security events that are coming in. Right. A lot of security technologies bring a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Right. They they like to alert about things. Right. But not everything is relevant. Not everything is important. We don't want to spend a waste time <laughs> on things that are irrelevant or unworthy. So being able to reduce the amount of of information they have to sort through to get to the important stuff that they do need to investigate right. and identify. And so the being able to take millions of events out of feeds and being able to use the visibility that I talked about to apply intelligence, right. learn what's important, correlate, so that you can understand what's important and, and, and remediate your threats there. That's a, another uh, example. Even we've seen our resellers mm -hmm. using our tools to go in when there are uh, malware breakouts or, um, or or active hacks and ownership of networks and kind of parachuting in, bringing these tools in and, and kind of extinguishing the fire, identifying the problem, remediating right. the threat, cleaning up the network, and then they they exit the uh, yeah. stage left. Right? Yeah, very so, good. You know, we, um, the old adage, you know, finding a needle in, in the haystack. Someone said to me, these days, it's finding a specific needle in a stack of needles is what we're doing now. <laughs> I mean, it's good, you know, you got to uh, <clears throat> really work, work things down. But um, but very good points there. And, and uh, you know, I like that emphasis on, on um, resiliency and the recognition that we're not going to stop every possible attack. It's just too complex. But if we can be resilient and recover quickly, it goes a long way to solving a lot of problems. Um, Scott Stevens over at Dell, what's uh, some programs you could cite where you think progress is really being made? Well, at Dell, we've developed a significant security portfolio. And again, it's, it's broad and it's broad reaching. Um, I could I could talk about some of the customers that we help with Dell software and their IAM or identity and access management mm -hmm. solutions to ensure that folks are getting the information that they're supposed to get and make sure that we're monitoring so that they're not getting into other areas. Um, SecureWorks helped stop 362 billion attacks for customers last year. Wow. I could tell you about uh, DDPE or Dell Data Protection Encryption Solutions, the only FIPS 140-2 level three certified solution on the market. Um, Case with patch management, which is some of the low hanging fruit right. to ensure that um, that networks and environments are secure. So there's, there's a number of different things and I could go on. <coughs> um, and we're continuing to help our customers solve specific security problems. Okay. As I look at the question, though, and I look at it more broadly, what I'd point at as a, as a federal program that I think is moving in the right direction, I'd have to point toward DA, uh, D8, <laughs> DHS's CDM program, or mm -hmm. Continuous Diagnostic, Diagnostic and Mitigation Program. Yeah, I think that's a good one, too. I agree with you. I think that, that'll go a long way in getting some consistency, like uh, Lieutenant General and Rear Admiral talked about earlier, getting some more standardized approaches and consistency across government and they go a long way to, to simplify, I don't want to say simplify because it's not simple, but yeah. eliminating some of the really, really complex things. Exactly. And I think, actually, I would use simplify to a certain extent because we're looking across agencies mm -hmm. and we're trying to develop a plan so that there's some consistency, bring up the security posture to at least a particular level where you can build a future foundation. And I'll do it, you know, enable these agencies to do it within a particular time frame. Right. Terrific. Um, Lewis Temkin over General Dynamics. What are some of the, cite some spe specific programs that you think uh, we're seeing progress? Sure. Well, at, at General Dynamics, uh, cyber is baked into everything we do. So I'd like to mention two. One focused on governance, the other on enterprise resiliency and threat protection. Uh, in the area of governance, you know, we're very proud of the support we've been providing since 
actually since 1998 to the Army Second Cyber Center, what Hemisphere, mm -hmm. formerly the CTNOS scout at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Uh, and that's a very critical role that we provide supporting the government to help uh, mature uh, and protect the, the, uh, the network that's supporting or providing access for over 1.2 million Army uh, users, you know, at more than 200 CONUS installations, you know, and we've helped them mature their legacy uh, help desk, putting idle processes in place, and really supporting all enterprise level operations. Uh, the other is some, some support where we've been providing to the Air Force, where we help the Air Force's network security perimeter be collapsed. Uh, uh, 16 cybersecurity gateways that basically form a security boundary shielding uh, all the Air Force, the 105 you know, United States Air Force bases worldwide. Uh, as part of this redesign, you know, we updated their critical infrastructure, uh, uh, intrusion protection systems, their uh, security and event management capability, uh, and you know, that kind of con construct fits very nicely into the joint information yeah. environment and the joint regional security stack architecture that's being implemented for JIE. So it sort of helps us set the stage for where the collapse of right. the DOD networks are right. are occurring. Well, certainly, certainly an awful lot of activity going on. Hopefully it continues and even grows now with uh, the attention on the subject. Uh, let's talk about uh, what's on the, in the front plate, front burner for this year. What are some of the priorities uh, moving forward here? Let's start with Brendan Good. Brendan, what are some of the priorities, that, what's uh, sort of like on your top, top list of things that you want to address this coming year? Sure. I, first of all, it's always fun doing these panels because I think you continue to see common themes being shared really across are. whether really across government I'm taking or a little with notes here when I hear common themes, you know, and uh, hopefully at the end maybe Absolutely. address some of those. And that, uh, that actually hits to a couple of the common themes, which is the continuing a healthy dialogue between mm -hmm. government and industry. Um, strengthening partnerships, our ability to collaborate, uh, strengthening the cybersecurity posture, raising that floor up so that we're working at a baseline, whether it's through best practices or at least instituting a set of capabilities, and um, continuing to emphasize the importance of cybersecurity in investments themselves. Sure. Um, particular to my organization, as an engineering organization, the goals and priorities for us are uh, engineering. Sure. Delivering capabilities, uh, using some of the most advanced tools and capabilities and uh, information that we have to secure our federal cybersecurity partners, but also to be able to share with commercial sectors so they can take advantage of what we have learned. Um, the second is the human element, building capacity inside the organization, the resourcing it, making sure that we have the best talent uh, to, to take on some of these most complex problems, growing an organization. Uh, give you an idea just in my organization alone. So in 2009, there was three of us in the oh, office. Wow. <laughs> so it became quite adept at everything from, uh, you know, building large system architectures to changing toner and printers. Sure. <laughs> um, to today where we are over 100 uh, personnel uh, just in the engineering group alone. Um, and the third is setting that vision. You, you yeah. act, how do we get proactive. One is not just building solutions to react to uh, issues of the day, but setting my vision for the next three to five years of where we need to take the organization to start looking at more proactive measures, whether, you know, leveraging not only the signature side of the house, but also looking at behavioral and how we're going to get in front of some of the adversaries. Excellent. Very accurate. Great points there. Uh, Rear Admiral Lytle, what's, uh, what's on sort of your list of to-dos for the upcoming year? Well, our, our list of to-dos is, is pretty, uh, pretty set. I mean, mm -hmm. since we started up as a command several years ago, we were kind of maintaining the same line. We have five major priorities. Okay. First is a trained and ready cyber force. We need to have the people trained and ready to manage and operate in this environment. The second is a defensible architecture across the Department of Defense, and that's where we get into the JIE sure. angle. We have to have an architecture that we can defend and maintain. The third is situational awareness. In order to have that mission force capable and have that architecture there, we have to be able to have awareness of what's going on in the infrastructure so that we can see, what, see yeah. the threat, see what the responses are going to be. The fourth one is command and control, because once we have that awareness and we have the cyber force, we have the architecture, we have to have ability to reach out and manage that. So we have to have a command and control structure in place so we can operate in cyberspace. And our last, our fifth priority is authorities and policy. As we move in the cyberspace, mm -hmm. um, the authorities and policies on how, who can do what and where it can be done are still not quite defined. They, they're different pieces of the authorities throughout our government. 
uh, that we need to work on and work with the legislature on getting everything lined up so that we can operate and we can respond in a timely fashion in case of an attack comes. Right. Very good point. And, and you know, and I guess policy and, and things like that are always <clears throat> not as fun to do, but I know when I did teach graduate school, I had students come in and talk about their programs, and one guy came in with this amazing story of all the things they're doing, and I said, is it written down anywhere? And, and he said, no. And I said, well, what happens if you leave? I mean, <laughs> does anyone know all the, so, uh, so very good point. You need to have, you know, <clears throat> the institutional knowledge carried forward, too. Uh, Lieutenant General Cardone, what's, uh, what's on your list of to-dos for the upcoming year? Well, the Secretary of the Army has been pretty clear on a uh, mission to defend all the Army networks and uh, build on what Jason had said. You know, often uh, people talk about it like an egg, you know, hard right. shell, right. gooey on the inside. <laughs> uh, and uh, so it's more of a transition to defense in depth okay. and to have a resilient network. That's probably the first piece. The second piece revolves around people and organizations. One big change this year is the Secretary made a decision uh, here right before the holidays to transfer, we call the proponent, over to Training and Doctrine Command. Mm -hmm. So they'll be able to put cyber through the whole Army now. That will be co-located with the headquarters when it moves to uh, Fort Gordon. Oh. And so you're going to have the institutional part of the Army co-located with the operational part of cyber. And I think that's going to bring some huge energy. But the entire proponency piece will happen this next year. And then the last piece is technology. Okay. Uh, it's virtualization, big data, cloud analytics, which is coming along as part of JIE, right. and it's a continual collapsing of the networks into a JIE-like architecture. Right. We're going to get a lot of energy on that this year. Yeah, terrific. I think the technology you just mentioned, I think, are probably our next three radio shows. I mean, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> you're right. They are hot, the hot topics that are out there right now. Uh, Scott Stevens, um, how about priorities from uh, from your perspective? What's some of the, the top things that you feel like uh, need attention? Yeah. Well, at Dell, the initiatives that we're moving forward with is helping our customers move to the cloud and also take on mobility initiatives. Mm -hmm. And, of course, those have very large cybersecurity components. Right. Um, we did have a discussion that, though, at times, too. You know, some people think, oh, the cloud is going to be a giant security problem. But others argue, no, if you go to the cloud, you, you, you can take a holistic approach because you're not going to take all of your legacy stuff. You can start with, a you know, like a clean... Well, well, that's exactly right. And so it, it's interesting the way that you frame that as well, <clears throat> because a lot of people look at the cloud as the ability to start new. But when we talk about holistic, we've got to be holistic. And right. so our data is on endpoints. Could be everyone here probably has at least one smartphone. Uh, could be in the data center somewhere, or it's out in the cloud. And so we have to be able to understand where all those things are. Um, as we start talking about our federal agency customers and we're looking toward the cloud, for example, we're still looking to maintain the efficiencies that cloud brings and there's cost savings that go along with that. <clears throat> so we're actually being driven, these federal agencies are being driven by um, mission need. Mm -hmm. And so we want to help them and uh, enable them to do that. Mobility is the same way. Sure. Imagine the ability to go out and do anything that you want wherever you do it. Right. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. But oh, yeah. I would say there's one more that I'd like to add here as we look holistically. And it's not necessarily just about the tools to get okay. things done. But, you know, let's take a concept like supply chain assurance. Right. So that is a key element as we start to build our foundation. How are we going to move forward? Oh, yeah. And, of course, Dell's always been a pioneer around supply chain management. Mm -hmm. So it's probably not a surprise that Dell's moving in the forefront to work with organizations like NIST and mm -hmm. some of the other folks that are building this next right. generation of the framework right. to right. be able to address those types and of issues. It comes back to, remember, I mentioned before, the trusted entities and so forth. As you get into supply, secure supply chain, you want to know who you're sharing with and where exactly. the, how that supply chain works. Uh, Lewis Temkin, what do you think some of the, uh, the priorities that, uh, that you have for the upcoming year? Well, I think it's helping customers move to a risk management framework mm -hmm. uh, where they're implementing continuous monitoring, standardization, and automation, you know, using technology to, to address some of those low-hanging fruits so that our technical talent can be put on more effective uh, or other more complex threats and tasks. Right. Uh, but also looking beyond today to the Internet of Things and how do we uh, bring engineering into the design process so that every product 
whether it be your refrigerator, which right. ha is connected to the internet, uh, is secure from when it comes into your house, right. and you're not worrying about how to secure your your refrigerator from connecting right. improperly <laughs> to or, your. Or about that malware burning right. in my refrigerator. Exactly. Somewhere. You know. And so insider <laughs> threats, how to mitigate them with improved uh, tools and TTPs. Uh, and evolving security models to meet this new architecture. We really need to move to more data-centric security models uh, and not just protecting the perimeter. Right. Uh, so there's a variety of initiatives that we're very much involved with our customers in supporting. Yeah, very good. Um, Jason Wright, what do you think? What are some of the priorities you, you have that, that you think should be addressed over the upcoming year? So we've got really three key areas that we're going to focus on over right. the next uh, 12 months here. One is to continue to educate the market about our new model of security, uh, which is, is partially data-centric for sure, but it moves to thinking of security in terms of before, during, and after an attack, okay. right? which is something that I don't think we quite do as well as we could today. And uh, I'll, I'll talk more about that um, uh, in a later section if, uh, if I have the opportunity. But uh, in addition, what we see moving forward from a technology perspective as we continue to develop our products, continuing to improve our intrusion prevention and detection systems with uh, anti-malware components, mm -hmm. right? And that's part of our before, during, and after messaging, how right. we look back in time to see things with, with regard to malware. Um, continuing to focus on developing our hardware platforms to maintain the, the speeds that are constantly increasing in terms of, of demand from, yeah. from you know, government and enterprise types of customers. Yeah. And finally, uh, continuing to develop our open source initiatives. Right, SourceFire has a rich history with yeah. developing Snort. That's, that's really where our company was founded. Our, our founder, Marty Resch, invented that, and we want to continue to maintain that. Uh, Clam AV. Um, indicators of compromise, open IOC, that's going to be a, an important behavioral-based uh, uh, indicator for identifying malware. I think a very important aspect of malware recognition going forward. And we'll have another uh, announcement uh, in, at RSA about open source uh, yeah, uh, initiatives. As well. And then the third uh, uh, integration point with Cisco. Right. Cisco has acquired us, completed that acquisition uh, late last year. So moving our technologies to work in conjunction with Cisco platforms, right, especially their firewalls sure, and, and other technologies moving forward. So uh, focusing on, on where it makes sense and how to most seamlessly, under a single pane of management, get the the value that SourceFire brings with in rich intelligence and visibility and, and prevention history uh, into Cisco's architectural and, and uh, firewall technologies out there. So right. integration with those uh, those technologies is another point of, uh, of our strategy. Yeah, excellent. Very good points there. Um, <clears throat> we want to switch gears here now. We're going to start talking about some of the challenges, the tough stuff, the things that are still need to be overcome in order to get these programs where you want them to be in the future. But before we do that, we're going to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio 1500 Welcome AM. Back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio 1500 AM. I'm Jim Flyzik here with Brendan Good from Department of Homeland Security, Lieutenant General Cardone from U.S. Army, Rear Admiral Lytle from the U.S. Cyber Command, Lewis Temkin from General Dynamics Information Technology, Scott Stevens from Dell Federal and Jason Wright from SourceFire. We're talking cybersecurity. We've been talking about progress, priorities, some programs that are moving forward. Let's talk a little bit about some of the tough things, some of the challenges that are out there yet that you need to overcome to get these programs where you want. Let's start with Rear Admiral Lytle. What are some of the challenges you see day to day that you still need to feel like have to be addressed to get where you want to want to go with these programs? Oh, there are so many. <laughs> the, uh, the two threat areas that we as a country really need to be concerned with are, are attacks from terrorism and attacks in cyber. And those two elements are not mutually exclusive, obviously. Right. Um, technology is going to march on, converging and connecting systems, people at an exponential rate. I really, uh, really enjoyed hearing the industry partners talk about some of their priorities in the last question round. Uh, stuff about risk management framework, data-centric architectures, open source technologies, cloud mobility. All those items are moving forward, and the focus on technology and the focus on security in those areas will be a challenge. As technology moves fast, we need to be agile and come up with an environment, not only technology-based, but also relationship-based, that can keep ahead of that 
that right. technology right. curve. Right. So that's going to be the challenge is staying ahead of that, not just from the technology point of view, but also from the management. Yeah, because the bad guys, um, they track the technology too. And when the good guys come out with something that uh, stops the current threat, the bad guys are looking for something to, you know, come out new that bypasses that. Mm -hmm. uh, Lieutenant General Cardone, what do you see as some of your big challenges that you're uh, trying to address to get where you want to go with your programs? So first, I'm in violent agreement with that. So let me just add to that conversation. <laughs> That's good. Uh, because, yeah, first, <laughs> uh, first, I, you know, I think we still have some challenges with culture, and what I mean by that is, you know, we need every soldier, civilian, contractor to internalize cybersecurity. Stop using the admin password when you're trying to fix things and leave it on afterwards. Uh, second is, people while being the first line of defense are also the greatest vulnerability, and poor user practices introduce enormous vulnerabilities in the network or not just education, but technology to help us with that. Finally, we need to move from a more dynamic to a more, or from a more static to a more dynamic defensive posture. I just don't think we can depend on a, the bottom line is if you stay still where you're at, you're actually moving backwards right. in today's environment. Right. And we got to internalize that and press on this, right. recognize that. Can't just wait around for something to happen. You have to. Uh, well, it will happen. Yeah. Okay. It's just a question is, are you ready when it comes? Right. <laughs> And generally, you just uh, made us 101 for 101 as our 101st uh, program. And when we talk challenges, uh, every single program, the word culture comes out onto the table in terms of a challenge. Uh, working cultures, mm -hmm. working coordination across agencies, uh, you know, young, younger workforce, older workforce, different ideas, and it, it truly is a, has been a, a consistent. For those of you who remember that old Groucho Marx uh, TV show where the, the magic word or whatever, I mean, culture would be our magic word. Uh, Scott, <coughs> um, Brendan, the, uh, how about over at Homeland Security? What are uh, some of the big challenges that you face day to day that you're trying to address to get where you want to go with all this stuff. Sure. Uh, cybersecurity is a problem that if you allow the scale and complexity uh, to overwhelm you, it can quickly. And capacity is an issue behind that as well. Uh, one thing we've been tackling with it is realizing it's a team sport. It takes interdisciplinary perspectives, everything from your engineers to your analysts to your legal to your policy to your everything to be brought in to help solve some of these complex problems. Uh, I believe we need to start uh, leveraging a lot more talent that's not only resident to us locally but across the community and be more aggressive about it. Uh, I believe that there's a couple of you know, paths that we can pursue to, to address some of these challenges. First is, is building the staff. We've, uh, in my organization, have done uh, quite a bit to leverage what uh, DHS has been trying to do on the education front, the scholarship for service, the college intern programs, helping to encourage college universities to make this a priority and, and going out there and doing the internship programs and turning them into career federal um, employees is creating a great pipeline. Went from struggling to find one or two to having right. people coming to us asking, right. hey, what do you have available for the summer? Uh, the second is, uh, think of like birds of a feather, establishing these collaborative engineering relationships with people trying to solve like problems in, in whether it's the federal government or in the commercial sector itself. Uh, so uh, there's no need to try to reinvent the wheel and try to relearn some things that other organizations have done. That, that to us has allowed us to tap into experiences out there from people that have failed before and how right. we can build from it. And the last is building agility into our systems, our processes, and even our staffing uh, to be able to adapt to the changing threats and technologies that are coming with it. Sure, well said, great points there. I know you, when you think of the challenge, you mentioned team sport. I mean, when to really deal with uh, this particular issue, you're, t you're talking about individuals in their homes, on their home computers, people walking around with handheld devices. It's, it, it's pretty much everybody who's touching the network, and that pretty much is everybody these days. Mm -hmm. So uh, it really does. Um, we want to switch gears, and we want to talk about the future. Where is this all going down the road? Uh, we always like to end our shows by talking about uh, a look forward as to where we're going. And, you know, we fear some people think we're going to have a digital Pearl Harbor someday. Some people think that's, uh, that's overblown. But my question, I guess, to you is, uh, looking out into the future, uh, will we get proactive? Are we going to get to a point where, you know, we feel like we're out in front of, the, out in front of these threats and we're able to, to head them off before they happen? Um, I know it's a tough question, but I, you're all very knowledgeable in the subject matter. Jason, uh, right over at Source Fire, what's, what's your crystal ball look like? Where is this going down the road? Well, in terms of being proactive about the threat, I mean, we, we do that today. 
in a lot of scenarios. Uh, our, all of our signature-based systems are basically being proactive. They know about the threat. They're able to identify the threat as it's can and neutralize that. And again, as I mentioned, that happens hundreds of thousands of times, of millions of times a day in every network, but that doesn't make the news, right? That's not right. what we hear about. So we, we are, to an extent, proactive. We are putting our technologies out there. We are establishing our perimeters. We are identifying our networks. We are establishing access control. All of that is part of our before stage, if, if I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the before, during, and after model that we think about. The during phase, while we're actually inspecting traffic in real time as it's coming through with intrusion prevention systems, and antivirus and anti-malware scanning as we see those technologies. That's the during phase. Mm -hmm. Now there's this concept of the after phase where you have to assume that there is a small but unfortunately increasing opportunity of hackers to use these zero-day threats that we have never seen before. So there is no signature. There is no way to just look at that file or that traffic pattern and say, oh, that's an attack, right? right? Because we've never seen it before. Mm -hmm. So being able to understand the decisions that you made and look back in time when new information comes forward and say, was that the right decision right. now that I know more about that file or that user device application operating system, et cetera? That's the after mantra. That's being able to look back on your own decisions and reanalyze. Right. And that is what I think is how we intend to move forward with the new security model, Terrific. how we hope to change the way people think and approach their security architectures and, and defending their networks. Very good. Excellent. Ex Scott Stevens, what do you think? What's it look like down the road for you, Scott? You know, it it's interesting because as you asked the question, I, I was tempted to kind of rephrase it to say, will we ever get in front of the hackers, right? Mm -hmm. Will we ever outsmart the hackers? And the threats are here to stay, mm -hmm. and they will continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. And as we think about how we've looked at security in the past, um, typically they've been developed in silos. And I'm not going to go so far to say that security is an afterthought. But it was certainly a component of the projects that we would take. Right. And then it worked right. in that I'd particular. argue in the past, you go back years, it was an afterthought. I I've, I've argue that, you know, it's come a long, long way now, but. Well, I wasn't going to say that here, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going back 20 years now. <laughs> no, that's true. Um, so, you know, security was seldom elevated so that it would be strategic across the board. Mm -hmm. And as we start moving forward and we start talking about these programs, and we start taking these steps to establish those foundations, um, I would submit that we're going to do more than just tighten up our security ship. Um, but we're going to see increased performance. We're going to start to see our environments fine-tuned and, and, you know, dare I say, we'll develop new technology and new methodologies so that we'll be able to do even more than we have been able to in the past. And, you know, the way that I look at this is, Think about a future um, where we'll be, you know, what would you be able to accomplish if you had no fear of data compromise? Right. And I think that's the direction we want to move toward, and I think that's the goal that we want to set. Yeah, terrific. Yeah. Yeah, my point about afterthought is, you know, I, I always kiddingly say that if we wouldn't ha have something called a firewall, if the software were developed securely in the first place, we wouldn't need a firewall to protect ourselves from the software. But anyway, uh, Brendan, what do you think? What's the future look like for you? Well, certainly the uh, threat doesn't go away. I yeah. think there's uh, too much of a reward for people that are successful. The low bar of entry to get in to be a successful hacker is, is there. So what do we do? It has to be strengthening the entire environment, the people, the processes, the systems. I think a lot of discussion today about building the capacity, building the knowledge, making sure that we do even the simple things. Raising the bar on um, um, cybersecurity and that defense in depth approach is critical. Uh, with that, I think along comes with it is the continuing the information sharing and collaboration, making sure that there's a common knowledge reference or a set of capabilities that people can draw from. The convergence of capabilities is an important aspect of it, too. We touched upon uh, programs like uh, continuous diagnostics, mm -hmm. mitigation, and Einstein 3. I see a great value in those two combined together because of the ability to be able uh, to uh, reduce vulnerability and susceptibility by, you know, uh, having understanding of our assets, our vulnerabilities, but coupling that with being able to still defend against uh, ongoing threats. If you put those together, now you have a pretty good understanding of the risk that's facing my enterprise right. and infrastructure. Um, developing those cyber risk plans, especially around the business process of how we execute a lot of the functions, protecting the data where the data needs to exist, and being responsive to, I think, the shifts in technology. Embracing technology 
uh, things like cloud, like mobility, but uh, incorporating cybersecurity as an element of the engineering process of how we're going to take advantage of that from the beginning, vice uh, uh, adopting a policy and then trying to, uh, around it, determine how we're going to secure it. So I um, believe those are some of the big pieces. Terrific. Thanks. Appreciate that. Uh, Lewis Temkin, what's, uh, what's the future look like to you? Well, I think as uh, many of the others have, have said, uh, we're, we'll never get to a point where we can say everything is done and our job is finished and it's secure and let's go home. I mean, the threat's always evolving. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, as Brendan said, the, the reward for a successful attack is too high. But you're going to, I think, see a continued emphasis on global network operations, uh, particularly across these new compute environments of cloud and mobile computing. You're going to see more interoperable uh, trust models for facilitating information sharing uh, across uh, secure uh, environments. You're going to see increased deployment of big data analytical tools mm -hmm. to make works. some sense out of all this data that we're collecting sure. and better enable us to detect APTs and other, you know, other kinds of threats. Uh, so I think those are some of the future things we're going to see. Yeah, terrific. Uh, Lieutenant General Cordon, what's, uh, what's your crystal ball look like out there? Where's this all going? Well, being in the Army, you don't win on the defense, right? <laughs> and so, because the problem is, you know, you have to be right 100 out of 100 times. The attacker only right. has to be right one out of 100. Excellent point. And so I think it demands better information sharing and intelligence. And you have to be able to, op we got to understand we're going to be compromised. How do we operate? well compromised, and then get them out as fast as we can while that's ongoing. Right. And so I think, you know, better resilience in the network, better, faster mitigation, and then technology that before on hardware security is hardwired in to begin with, right. I think will help us a lot in the long run. So we're going to be on the defense, but the bottom line, we can make that defense a lot stronger if it's in depth all the way from the device all the way to the code. Right. Very well put. Excellent, excellent points there. Rear Admiral Lytle, uh, what do you see down the road? Where is this all going in, uh, for you? What do you see the, f the your vision of the future out there? Well, everything everybody already said is, is all good. What we want to get there. But, okay, so that's uh, like the backup band. That's now right. You can with the I can summarize it all. <laughs> the, uh, but in, in simplistic terms, we've got to get cyber right. I mean, we, we've got to acknowledge this environment, this domain, as not only just a business and an IT back, backdrop, but it's an operational area that we, we operate businesses, we operate organizations, we operate from the Department of Defense point of view in. We've got to get it right. And that means not just baking security into the, into the systems, but we've got to bake security, we've got to bake cyber awareness into the mindset of everybody. Mm -hmm. And once we get to that, and we get to that vision in the future where everybody understands cyber, it's part of their daily life, they understand they have to be careful how they do this, they understand how we can work with organizations, we've got information, information sharing across government industry so we can share the threat picture, we can share the responses. That, that's where we have to get to as a country in order to maintain our, our, our way of life as we have it today. Yeah, very well put, very well put. Get those, get rid of those yellow, st yellow stickers that, uh, with the passwords. And, uh, but I am seeing, I think, just a lot of just new sites coming up have a lot more security built in than what we've seen in the past, even commercial sites. Uh, let me try to do a little bit of recapping here over the last couple minutes. Um, we talk quite a bit about cybersecurity. What I heard on, on, in the, the progress area was this movement more towards uh, consolidation and single model approaches to try to get down to, um, you know, we're not dealing with thousands and thousands and thousands of, of different products, but we can get down to uh, a finite, more finite number that can be managed um, and take a more holistic approach. And there are things like cloud and things like that that will allow somewhat of a holistic approach. Um, I heard progress and in information sharing came across from everyone. I mean, it pretty much, uh, if I guess uh, a theme throughout the entire show, it was information sharing and trying to get more information um, uh, across government as well as best practices out to industry. And I think that uh, resonated very, very well. Uh, we heard a lot about awareness and the, uh, the need for uh, constant vigilance to make sure that we have that awareness thing always out there. And, uh, and we have uh, the President of the United States talking about the cybersecurity, and, uh, and so we've got the awareness at the, the highest levels, and I think it's important to keep it there. Um, uh, in, in programs, we heard a lot about, I like the, the idea about the red teams, and uh, 
as uh, I know when I was at the Treasury and was responsible for our network, I would have uh, intelligence community folks uh, trying to find out ways to get in that our folks didn't know about. And you learn a lot that way. Uh, we also heard program focusing on people, programs that are trying to get people and people up to speed and the right people in the right place and developing them. Uh, we heard about, you know, Einstein, and we heard uh, the one I like to, it was about resilience, about programs that allow us to recover fast, recognizing that there's going to be attacks. Uh, priorities, uh, I heard the word collaborate quite a bit when we talk priorities, the need for good collaboration. Um, I heard uh, under priorities, uh, uh, capacity, need for capacity, need for training, need to get uh, depth, um, you know, Brendan had three people, you now have uh, significantly more than that, but you know, you, you need a bench here too. Uh, and I heard a lot of priorities about situ situational awareness, better situational awareness so you know what you're dealing with. Uh, when we talk challenges, uh, we started off right away by saying this is complicated. It is extremely complicated, so there are a lot of challenges. And just knowing what to address first becomes a, a tough question. Um, and the issue of keeping up with technology, it changes so fast that to stay ahead of that technology curve is a real challenge because uh, every day there's something new coming out that potentially could be a threat. Um, and and uh, as always, we heard about that culture issue. Uh, you need a culture that's going to understand they, these issues and be able to address them. And uh, the other point I, I really liked was uh, the, the comment that it's a team sport. It's uh, no one person, no one entity, no one agency is going to fix this problem. This is, uh, this is going to involve everybody. Uh, the good thing about the future, I heard better sharing and more proactivity. Um, that's pretty much uh, the, the, the themes there. So let me stop here and first thank our panelists for taking time from their busy, busy schedules to be with us. Uh, thank our sponsors, without which uh, we wouldn't have a show. Thanks to the good people here at Federal News Radio, and most importantly, thanks to the listening audience. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM.